Good morning and welcome to the second day of The Meaning of Eugenics, Historical and Present Day Discussions of Eugenics and Scientific Racism. I'm Christopher Donahue, the NHGRI historian. Yesterday, we had a frank and meaningful discussion of the complexities of eugenics and its depravity in the context of institutionalization and in the context of institutionalization and sterilization, a frank accounting of some of its grievous harms. Yesterday was also about how eugenics and scientific racism and its practices cease if all of us reject the central premises of eugenics, that individuals need to be so-called fixed or cured to conform to narrow prejudice standards of function, in quotes, and fitness, in quotes. And I think one issue which emerged yesterday, which I think is incredibly important in this context, is why does genetics have such an appeal? And I think this is because genetics and a discussion of, of, of genes and heritability uh, presumes that if an individual is fixed or cured, then a society's ills are solved. And I think this moves us away from thinking of ourselves as having a communal responsibility and a universal ethics of care of autonomy and of personhood, which really is an affirmation of the right of difference, which really needs to be embraced. As Julia Watts Belser writes, eugenics envisions, and here I quote, liberation through the denial of bodily and sensory difference. As Marius Torda, the co-convener of this conference pointed out, the key to ending eugenics and scientific racism is rehumanization and resisting dehumanization. And I think that affirming difference and denying narrow utopian accounts of ability and of difference is an essential part of this. The task of today's lectures and today's presentations is to engage is to re-engage with these complex and often frankly disturbing histories of eugenics and its practices. But throughout the second day of these, of today's, uh, part of today's talks, we will also uh, give our audiences uh, a number of resources in order to deepen their understanding and to engage and emerge with these complex histories in a way that allows them to confront eugenics and scientific racism. I will now ask Marius to make some concluding mar uh, remarks to open the second day of this conference. Over to you, Marius. Thank you, Chris, and uh, good morning, everyone. It is a real pleasure to share with you uh, today's panels and to uh, say a few words um, by way of welcoming you to our symposium. Yesterday was uh, extraordinarily rich uh, in terms of the information we shared, the debates we had, and the only enemy we, we faced was the enemy that we all face in our lives, which is the short time we had at our disposal. Uh, we only wish we could have explored some of the themes and the question asked a bit longer. Today uh, starts with, uh, with, with a big announcement, and uh, I would like to uh, uh, alert everyone to the fact that today is International Disability Day. And uh, this is a very important uh, uh, day and important issue. And we discuss the history of eugenics and the legacies of eugenics, and we cannot but um, forcefully uh, declare our understanding uh, and sympathy uh, for those who had suffered the eugenic, from eugenic practices and from uh, uh, eugenic uh, thinking throughout the 20th century. As we pointed out uh, yesterday, eugenicists were constantly alarmed by the presence of people with physical and learning disabilities. Racial and social and cultural boundaries uh, were erected between those who were considered to be eugenically valuable individuals and those were deemed otherwise. And these uh, boundaries uh, were, um, as we heard yesterday, uh, were repeatedly reinforced uh, from slavery onwards uh, in the case of the United States, uh, for example, through racist legislation, medical institutionalization, 
and state-sanctioned policies of segregation and annihilation in some cases. In the 20th century, we pointed out eugenic beliefs supported the murder of millions of people belonging to religious, ethnic, and sexual minorities, and those living with disabilities. And it motivated the institutional confinement and sterilization of those deemed a threat to society, which continues to this day. And of course, we need to mention, albeit very briefly, and we'll hear uh, about it later in one of the presentations that on, on the 14th of July, 1933, as some of you know very well, Nazi Germany enacted the law for the prevention of hereditary disease offspring, mandating the forced sterilization of individuals with physical and mental disabilities. And thousands of children and adults with disabilities were murdered during the T4 euthanasia program. We also discussed yesterday how eugenicists followed dominant social and political practices and that eugenics should not be separated from the culture it inhabits. The questions eugenicists asked and answered about an ideal society, as well as the interpretation they extracted from their research and scientific experiments were clearly shaped by cultural attitudes, cultural needs, and political possibilities. Also, we heard yesterday that eugenicists advertised themselves as guardians of society's moral behavior, promoting sexual control, cleanliness, the well being of future generations, and the ideal of married life. Their ideas incorporated both nature, which is to say good ancestry, and nurture, good environment. For instance, choosing your spouse wisely was advocated by the eugenicists. And they popularized this message to wider audiences through posters, films, articles in the daily press, fairs, and exhibitions. Idealized versions of white masculinity and femininity were commonly used to depict ideas of marriage, racial vitality, and motherhood, accompanied by accessible language. We also pointed out that the development of eugenics did not end with the Second World War. Eugenic practices continued, in some cases uninterruptedly, into the post-war period, when the political project of crafting a new world, freed from the clutches of fascism and Nazism, dovetailed perfectly with the eugenic project of population control, family planning, and elimination of genetic disabilities. We also pointed out uh, that uh, there have been broad changes in how eugenics is theorized, promoted, and practiced since the time of Francis Galton and Charles Davenport and Alfred Plutz, the big uh, founders uh, of eugenic movements in Britain and America and Germany. For these individuals, for example, eugenics was closely connected to government interventions, such as encouraging racially worthy people to reproduce and segregating disabled people. But state-led eugenic programs became less and less acceptable to promote after 1945. So it was discussed yesterday, forms of eugenics we have today are framed within a different rhetoric, the rhetoric of individual choice, for example. So legacies of eugenics, and we'll continue to debate and explore some of them today, continue to affect current politics and culture, promoting discrimination, inequality, and divisions in society. Skillfully and worryingly, I think, during the last decade, eugenics maneuvered its way back into a position of authority by associating itself with a host of human concerns, from designer babies to genetic screening for disability, from environmentalism and ecology to the rise of ethnic nationalism and white supremacy. So we are today uh, looking forward to uh, an amazing, uh, an amazing program, and I hope you will join me in uh, in, in participating, raising questions, and uh, challenging uh, the scholarship we are uh, producing, and challenging the views that are uh, associated with this scholarship, so that we have a very fruitful, enriching, and uh, strong and solid, and uh, wonderful conversation. Thank you.